Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for joining us for a panel discussion on the healthcare needs of refugees. I'm Michelle Sear, Senior Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, and I am standing in for Dean Mukesh Jain, who is unable to be here today. This is the second seminar in a series looking at healthcare and conflict zones, humanitarian emergencies, and their aftermath. The idea for this ser series came about as the leadership of the medical school with Dean Jane considered what we, within the scope of an academic institution and in alignment with our mission, could do in light of the situation in the Middle East. While today's panel will not be addressing specifically the refugee situa uh, situation caused by the Israel-Hamas war, we will learn from our panelists about the universal lessons and considerations regarding the needs of refugees and displaced persons. I am very grateful to our moderator, Dr. Nicole Nugent, and our panelists, Dr. Carol Lewis, Myra Sullivan, and B.B. Trin. They have all been doing amazing work, particularly for the refugee population right here in Rhode Island. We are grateful to them for being here today and for sharing their experiences. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator, Dr. Nicole Nugent. Dr. Nugent is a professor of psychiatry and human behavior and holds academic appointments in the departments of pediatrics and emergency medicine as well. She is the founding director of the Rhode Island Resilience Lab and associate director of the Stress, Trauma and Resilience Initiative, also known as STAR. She provides direct clinical care as the director of psychological services at Hasbro Children's Hospital's Pediatric Refugee Integrated Care Service. Dr. Nugent has been continuously federally funded since 2009 and has served as the PI and co-investigator for more than two dozen federal grants. Her research is aimed at understanding the interplay of biological and socio-environmental factors on psychological outcomes such as post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, and suicidal thoughts and behaviors in adolescents during times of stress, and transition. I know that she will want to tell you more about the work um, at the Hasbro Refugee Clinic, so I will stop here. Thank you all once again for joining us today. Over to you, Nicole. Thank you for such an amazing uh, it, framework and introduction and um, a chance also to, to be a part of this conversation. I'm especially excited that um, our panelists today are folks that I think the world of. Um, and actually, Dr. Carol Lewis is the person who started the Pediatric Refugee Clinic, this amazing model of integrated care, um, this wonderful medical home model back, uh, I don't remember now, 13 years ago or something, um, but some number of years ago uh, at Hasbro Children's. And I, I actually joined a little bit, um, a little bit into the medical home and I will never forget the very first family that I, I shadowed. So before I started uh, really jumping in and doing intervention work, I just shadowed families from the beginning to the end of their appointments. And it was just so amazing to me to watch how families would show up, just kind of walk into a room um, and felt like this was really truly their home and knew that at some point someone was gonna come with an interpreter or with an interpreter phone or device. Um, and so it was just so humbling and amazing to get to be part of this really truly integrated care. I, um, as I you had mentioned um, that I have a lot of uh, research pursuits, but um, at various points I've thought, oh, it's hard to fit the time in to still, get to be a part of the clinic and uh, I can't imagine walking away from it. It's just such an amazing experience. And so I'm really grateful for uh, that opportunity. And um, this is the perfect, perfect uh, opportunity for me to now introduce Dr. Carol Lewis. Uh, maybe you can share a little bit about yourself. Thank you. You're my partner. I, I hope you never get so many grants that you have to leave your time uh, doing your clinical work, but um, yes, yeah, so, so I am at Hasbro Hospital in the primary care. So a lot of people don't know this, but uh, Hasbro prim uh, Primary Care exists within, you know, the larger hospital. So it's not just a tertiary care center. We see about 10,000 kids, mostly from the neighborhood, mostly on Medicaid. And within this, we have a couple of programs that um, 
address some of the specific needs of different groups of people. And one of them is the Refugee Health Program. And it's evolved a lot over the last, I think it was 2006 when we we, we started it. Um, and at some point, maybe I'll have a chance to tell you how it was built because it was really built by the refugee families. They were the ones that informed us. And um, we it's a training program. So we have residents who are able and medical students who come through and, and join me. Um, once the children are seen during an intake, they are then mainstreamed into the regular program with the same provider who did the intake because they're kids and they're part of the fabric of the whole whole place. So that's what I do. Wonderful. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I um, I wanted to also introduce um, Dr. Elise Beebe Trin, who is another uh, person who just has uh, changed the shape of refugee families here in Rhode Island. Um, I first met Vivi, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, maybe, maybe less. Um, yeah, 10 years ago. And, uh, and, you know, just was, uh, I'll, I'll, I will let you introduce yourself, but just to say out loud that I think um, I've learned so much from you and the work and dedication that you've shown to our communities here in, in Rhode Island. And even after you've left, you've stayed um, such a force for, for Brown and for the refugee families around here. Thanks, Dr. Nugent. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Vivi Trin, and I'm an OBGYN. Um, I'm calling here from our clinic at the Providence Community Health Center on Atwood Street in Olneyville. Uh, the PCHC is an FQHC, and it's been really amazing. Um, I was a PLEMI student, and then, uh, so I, was, I did undergrad as well as medical school at Brown. I'm originally from California. I'm the daughter of Vietnamese refugees, and I first became involved with the refugee community in Providence in what felt like a bit of an accident. I was a first year and frankly, very lost and very unhappy and not sure if med school was the place for me to be. Like many plumies who may be in the audience, I kind of felt like a commitment that I made too young. And I had over the years developed a real love for education and youth work and was looking for a way to merge um, these two paths. And so, I found out about Dr. Lewis's refugee clinic, applied for some funding that would help me do like a little project based there. And as I did so, it became pretty clear organically that the way I could become most meaningfully involved and develop real um, kind of more intimate and substantive relationships with some of the families I was meeting was actually by becoming a tutor through a program that's very much connected to the refugee clinic called Bright, which is actually a student run program at Brown called Brown Refugee Youth Tutoring and Enrichment that pairs mostly college students, but the occasional wayward graduate students such as myself um, for one-on-one -on -one in home um, kind of English language acquisition focused tutoring for newly arrived K-12 youth. Um, and so um, knowing full well that it, wasn't the most biomedical thing in the world, but it felt very real. I got a 2T and um, the relationship just totally changed my life. Um, it's Her name is Apolline. She's well known by Dr. Dr. Lewis. She's like a famous person in the community. I met her when she was nine years old. She had recently arrived with her family from the Congo um, because she had um, a chronic illness. She had never had the opportunity to go to school, whereas her siblings did have some interrupted education. Um, and so she and I like learned to read together in her house over the course of a couple of years. Um, and she graduated two years ago as a salutatorian of Hope High School. And actually we were hanging out last night. She came over for dinner and we watched Past Lives, great movie, and we did a puzzle. Um, so she remains a very important person in my life. Um, that then led to me um, using my elective in my third year to help to ultimately co-direct um, Bright's sister program, which is a summer camp that brings together all the refugee youth. It's called Camp Rise. Um, 
and uh, part of why I've moved back from California back to Providence after doing residency out there is to help um, really build up that organization, which was previously also student run, but is now its own 501c3. Um, and I'm on the board of that. Um, so uh, that those are kind of my main ways of being involved with the refugee community in Rhode Island. Um, would love to answer any questions for anybody who finds any of that work really interesting. I have some clinical experience as well, um, and hopefully we'll touch on those throughout the panel, but um, though that Bright and Rise are kind of, were my main gateways into working with this community, and obviously it really changed my life. I did not realize I would come back to Rhode Island, but here I am. So that's me. Thank you so much. Um, and, uh, um, I, I should have mentioned that um, myself and Dr. Carol Lewis have uh, had the great honor of getting to kind of be co-advisors for um, the Bright program. And we're always sort of, I don't wanna say on call, but we're always sort of available for Camp Rise as well, which have been such an amazing um, impacts on our refugee families. Um, and so the, the last person that I wanted to introduce today um, is Myra, who, um, again, as a part of this small world of refugee work, I actually sort of met through a colleague um, who was doing, uh, who I was doing research with, with Syrian refugees in Michigan. And so um, I'll stop there and I'll let you introduce yourself. Thank you, Dr. Nugent. I'm so excited to be here. I am the really the newest kid on the block here with a bunch of really experienced and amazing panelists. So I'm just really grateful uh, to be here and to be present. My name is Humara Sullivan. I go by Myra. I'm a second year child and adolescent psychiatry fellow. I'm one of the chiefs of the program here. I did most of my training uh, back home in Michigan. So my undergraduate uh, as well as my medical school was in the state of Michigan. And I did adult psychiatry residency at the University of Michigan and then decided I wanted to move and see a different place and so ended up coming here for fellowship and really, really glad that I did. So like Dr. Nugent was mentioning, I uh, became familiar with Dr. Jabenbacht, who is a wonderful, wonderful psychiatrist who's doing so much work uh, related to refugees and their exposure to trauma uh, within the inner city Detroit area uh, and introduced me to Dr. Nugent once he heard that I was going to be going to Brown for fellowship. So I'm really grateful for that, that introduction and how we started to talk. Uh, my exposure to, you know, working with the refugee population came a few different ways. Uh, one of them is, as I was a medical student, I got to interact with a fairly large, actually, refugee population within Detroit. Uh, there were many local clinics that I got to rotate through as a medical student where we would treat uh, many refugee families. And so that was kind of firsthand exposure for me um, to be able to learn how to interact with these families and work with these families in a clinical setting. And that was really meaningful and something that I really enjoyed. I also was a part of an organization called United Michigan uh, for a number of years as a medical student and as a resident, and that organization's primary purpose was to help connect refugee families and families who are seeking asylum uh, to resources within their community, and that was something that really just was really important for me and meaningful for me. The other piece that I'll add here is some of my own personal experience, which is what originally drew me to this work. Uh, so my own family came to the United States as asylum seekers from the country of Bangladesh, which is where my family is, is from. Uh, at the time, this was the early 90s, and so the asylum process, which is still very, very delayed, um, was extremely delayed back in the 90s. And so it took about 10 to 15 years for our process, for our like a case to actually end up going to court. Uh, the process that followed afterwards was extremely difficult and challenging, um, as you know, I think we'll all sort of allude to. The process of being an asylum seeker or being a refugee in this country is really, really challenging for many reasons. Uh, in our particular case, our asylum case was actually denied, and so my family and I ended up getting deported from the United States. I was 16 at the time. So spoiler alert, I'm here. So you know that the story does have a good ending um, and ultimately we were able to come back to the US but that in and of itself is a really rare occurrence and is not something that typically happens. And so a lot of what you know I'll probably be discussing today um, as we go through our questions if Dr. Nugent takes us through this discussion is my own personal experience in working with healthcare professionals um, as you know someone you know coming from a different country and being able to experience the American culture and learning how to uh, transition here. So just really grateful to be here. Thank you, Dr. Nugent. 
I'm so glad that you're here. <laughs> um, so, you know, as I was thinking through what would be some of the questions that um, I wondered to learn from these amazing panelists, um, I, I also found myself thinking back, what are the things that, you know, I would want to share if uh, about the work that I've gotten to do. And um, one of the things that really strikes me is how much I've learned from the families that I've gotten to work with over the course of the little over a decade now. Um, and so I was really kind of hoping to, to pose that question to you all, um, thinking about what is it, what is it that you feel like you've learned from working with them? Um, and I know probably everyone has an answer to this. <laughs> so um, who wants to take it first? I'll be brave. <laughs> um, I I'm just so glad to 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 be with these other two panelists. I, I you both have amazing stories. So please, I'm going to have you. I'm going to try and be brief because I really am in interested in hearing what you have uh, to share with us. Um, you know, that's kind of in some ways the easiest question and the hardest question. Um, it's easiest because we can think of so many different. <clears throat> moments that have taught us, but also it's hard because there's so much to say. Um, I think if you had asked me this 10 or 15 years ago, it would have been a different answer. I think looking at it now, my answer would be more, well, humility, obviously. Um, but I think the way that I have interacted with my refugee patients now is very different in that it's much more strength based and I know we all are talking about that in medical school and and um, in our practice in general because that's good for everyone right um but I think in a much more um so much more in the forefront I I know that in when I first started that there was a lot of needs 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 where the focus is is on that and the trauma and you know what? It's really there. They, um, these families have have experienced such incredible trauma, or most of them. You know, that's again another thing I've learned. Don't generalize. Um, and but there is also so much strength and and so much resilience. And I feel that oftentimes when um, when you're in with a have an interaction with a family or in a room with a family, sometimes we can be so drawn or focused to the need and the trauma it's almost like there's this third party in the room which is that that this kind of that takes up space sometimes too much space and interferes with really getting to know them as as a human and what their needs are what their dreams are and and what they have in common with all of us you know um uh, and so i've um I think that's one of the most important things that I've learned because I also think sometimes when we talk about trauma and need, it tends to otherize people. And I, I think that's so what I, I have learned is that if I can be present in the room with a family and not pretend, not to pretend that the trauma hasn't happened or the needs aren't there, but also see them be present enough to see them as just the amazing human beings they are and and with what strengths they've they're they have that often just you know make me feel pretty inadequate you know um so that's certainly one of the things that I've learned is to be very strength based in my interactions I love that um and I I have to say, I wholeheartedly agree with everything you just said um, over and over. I've had that experience of, um, especially early on, really finding my, assuming that the work was about the trauma of the past um, and not sort of being present and being kind of in that space um, and letting families guide me through that process. Um, so I love, I love that you pointed out sort of that third I think call it party in the room. I think that was really helpful to keep in mind as we work with our families. Um, all right, Dr. Sullivan, Dr. Trin, who wants to 
Who's curious to, who wants to share next? Um, I can share. Um, I think two things come to mind. I think going off of what Dr. Lewis said about not making assumptions, I think I came into this work making a lot of assumptions. Um, and what I've learned is that the label of refugee contains so much. And it's ultimately a political label that some people get and some people don't for lots of reasons. What makes somebody who is in maybe like a UN affiliated refugee camp, you know, somewhere uh, in West Africa, for example, get to have that status and someone who's crossed many borders from Central America not. And um, I think understanding that these labels, refugee, asylum seeker, et cetera, um, are both useful and ultimately political. Um, and it's been really an honor in a lot of spaces to, to work in settings that um, are really trying to marshal resources kind of regardless of those, even if legally they actually come with different repercussions. Um, related to that, I think I used to inadvertently make assumptions about the different backgrounds people were bringing with them and quickly learned, like for example, the 2T I had for all those years um, is somebody who never got to go to school. And on the other hand, uh, a gentleman I met once through uh, a workshop I was doing at the Dorcas International Institute kind of related to RISE was a physician in Iraq. Um, and was now working as a scribe in the emergency room, which takes just so much humility and adaptability um, and resilience. Um, and so realizing that that label of refugee can really mask a really um, diverse set of class experiences, educational experiences, um, and really trying to get to know people's individual stories to understand who they are and what their dreams are and what their needs are. Um, and then that being said, the third thing is that all that being said, all children seem to love the same thing, which is swimming and snacks. And that's like what the great part is about, um, about things like camp, about things that are strength-based and joy-based and um, not just, you know, not, not thinking of, clinical problems and clinical solutions. Um, so those are some of my big takeaways from this work. I love how you both came back to the same sort of um, focus on um, on the pot, like the positive and the, the fun and the joy and the, you know, kind of strength-based piece. Um, I wholeheartedly, I agree with everything you had to say. It was, um, I definitely, feel like there's a lot more in there and, and maybe we can get to some of it as we talk today. But um, that strength-based piece I think is so important and is one of the things actually that our uh, colleague um, Javing and Bach has, has, it's been really amazing to see how their group, similar to the ways that we here in Rhode Island have done an amazing job with Bright and Rise, they've also, built um, dance and movement and all of these other opportunities into um, the, the positive piece. So what one of the things that we know in, um, in suicidality and in depression research is that it's not just the bad stuff, it's the absence of the good stuff. And so, you know, it can be easy again to get focused. I I, I'm just gonna keep the whole rest of this time I'm gonna talk about that third, party in the room of trauma or stress or whatever, um, but that it's easy to get distracted by that and then miss those opportunities to be present. Um, and I wholeheartedly agree with what you said, Vivi, that um, kids have a great, kids are really good at bringing you back to that fun and not being in the moment. Um, and so I think uh, it's, it's really wonderful when we can follow that lead as well and listen. Um, so, so Dr. Sullivan, I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts. Really just echoing what Dr. Trin and Dr. Lewis have already, already said so well. Um, 
I I'll add a little bit just from the the other side. So being a you know being a patient and being you know a part of a family that has just gotten to America and is seeing providers, um, I can tell you just a little bit personally. You know I think we we met with providers and I, I recall this you know as a as a middle school middle school student um, meeting with providers who would make many assumptions and would you know assume that like my parents didn't really speak english or that they couldn't quite understand what was written on you know pages in front of them whereas in reality you know both of my parents are college graduates and had been living a certain lifestyle in bangladesh before coming here and so i think when i when i do think about assumptions and things that are made i think often when we think of refugees or asylum seekers we tend to think of just folks who are coming from really low income households and who have just like been struggling the whole time they were in their country of origin before coming here and that's not really the case you know the the case is very so much family to family and so being on the other side of that you know it was really challenging to to see and to feel like wow hmm why was why was that assumed um and the reality is that we you know we all have assumptions we all have cultural biases and things that we bring into a room when we're interacting with families and kids and so just being aware of those you know i think eliminating all of those is not realistic but being aware of what it is that you bring into the room when you're interacting with the family can make such a big difference. Um, and I think each interaction that I have had as a provider with a family, um, you know, whether they're asylum seekers or refugees, I think has been incredibly humbling for me and also reminds me about my own biases and assumptions. And so I just think it's important to keep it in mind. I love everything that you just said. And um, it it makes me actually think about um, some conversations that I had very early on in this work with Dr. Lewis. And then also um, there was a, a really great documentary that um, I know you, you all put together um, where we were getting some perspectives from the refugee families of their experience, um, home across lands is one of them. But then there was a second one, um, I recall Dr. Lewis, that was involving more of the medical students' experiences of working with refugees. I wondered, uh, hearing you know Dr. Sullivan talk, it just got me thinking about all that uh, I remember learning from you in that process. I wonder if you wanna speak at all to that piece of, of of humility and being present and like listening. Um. Uh, yes, I think um, it's not always easy in a clinic. You know, this is not how our medical care is structured to sit quietly and, you know, there's charts to write and you get 20 minute blocks of time and it's very, very difficult to feel present. And, but one of the advantages that I have um, is that I am a primary care uh, physician. So if there's anybody, any attendees or, who are thinking about primary care, it's great because you relationships develop um, between provider and patient over time, just like in real life. And uh, it's okay that you have 20 minutes and maybe cheat and take 30 minutes because you're going to see, see them over and over again. And it's also, and I've done some things that probably not everybody has to do to make it easier to be present so I can really hear and listen is, I don't bring a laptop into the room. Isn't that weird? Um, I bring a pen and a scratch paper and I sit down on the, at the level of the kids on the stool and I hand it and listen. And it, People have different ways of doing that, that, but that's how I do it so that I can really be um, present and not dealing with, um, you know, other things or be distracted. And I think it's actually easier for families to, you know, to be able to, you know, relate, relate back. As far as um, we did do another one, I was, I was trying while you were saying, it, I couldn't remember the name of it, but it was called, it was a grant. Um, and we developed a film called T Time to Heal, where what we did when it showcased some several families and what they needed and what they felt they the issues were with navigating. And we gave the residents, I don't know if we could get away with it now, but we gave the residents a an afternoon 
off where we had one week where there were no patients booked except for urgent care patients. And they were able to interact and talk to refugees very informally, not as a patient, um, were, and, and were able to digest some of that experience. Um, what I've learned also in the bigger picture in, well, another picture is not necessarily bigger, is um, how listening to families and helping them define what is going to be addressed is hugely important. I mean, I think that when I first started training, it was always, we needed to see what needed to be done. And we would tell the families what should be done. And there, there you go. And I think that fortunately things have changed, but what happened back in 2006, when we developed the refugee program, we didn't have the program. We would see refugees in the clinic, but we might have a family of six kids and one kiddo would get put in a, an appointment three months later and two others there, and there was nothing really consistent. It wasn't very focused or or thoughtful as to how we were gonna welcome them. And there was an influx of, uh, in 2006, of Liberian refugees and the resettlement agencies um, said, we don't know what to do. We can't wait three or four months. They need to get, go to school. They need to get you know job training, blah, 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 blah. So we said, okay, we'll help. And we came in on a Saturday, there were some nurses and the the volunteer resettlement agencies were there. And we had the internists came and we had, you know, a, a, tried to do, and we were more thoughtful about it. We said, well, what are we going to be doing? What are we thinking about? What do we, at the time we were thinking more medical, you know, like CDC, what are we going to screen for, you know, all of that stuff. But what ended up happening is we found that when we were more intentional about their needs, it, everybody was happier. So we said, oh, let's have, let's, maybe we should do it this way, a little separate for at least that first visit. And then we said, okay, but we didn't know what to do. <laughs> you know, we were like, well, what should we do? What is it? And, um, what we learned is to ask the families and we would have focus groups or town halls as they'd call them. And they would say, it's confusing. It's really confusing to navigate this. It's, it, it's, um, you know, the differences are very different. You know, we may not have even preventive services in the country where uh, country of origin or country of immigration. And so we said, okay. Oh, and, and trust, trust is a very difficult piece. So We'd say whoever does the intake was going to be their PCP if the family wanted, so they could have the same the, the familiarity. Um, and then they would say, um, "We know that my child is sad, or my child is acting out at home, and we don't do mental health. How do I do that? How? What would make it easier?" And that's when uh, my my dear colleague Dr. Nugent came on board, and we said, "Well, let's co-locate it." So we're right there, shoulder to shoulder. They can see me. They can. See, but that was all all on the from the uh, from the patients. Then they said, "I really, really want my child to do well, and they in school. I know how important it is. And we've been here for six months, and I have a a colleague in the community who says their child has a tutor." So I said, ah, oh, Bright, we have to find out about Bright and incorporate that. Have trouble getting a dentist. We brought in um, a, uh, you know, St. Joseph's Dental comes in and sends a resident over to get them hooked up. Um, being, getting their green card, you know, becoming a legal permanent resident is very important after a year they can apply. And that's a costly thing. If you go out into the community, there are civil surgeons in the community, but it's usually anywhere from 200 to $400 a pop. And we found that out. We thought that was ridiculous, especially since we have the medical records. So for the kids, we can do it within the clinic and, and not worry about it. Insurance doesn't pay for it. Medicaid doesn't pay for that exam. And we do it for free. And we usually tag in some sort of follow-up visit. Um, so I became a civil surgeon so we could do that. So there's these little pieces that I would have never had, it. you know, 2006, I would have never thought, oh, I should become a civil surgeon, you know, but it was all about listening and letting them guide it. So I often feel like the refugee health program is really their program. And it's all so much better now because there's so many other community partners like Refugee Dream Center and Women's Refugee Health and DOH is so wonderful and it's a great support. So, and even DHS has been leading a lot of uh, groups that uh, help bring us all together. So, um, I could go on forever. I better. 
I think, um, no, those are really helpful. And for folks who are curious, maybe we can, um, maybe by the end of this, I can try to find uh, the link. I know Home Across Lands is something that you can order online. I, I'm assuming that the other documentary is not available online, but um, if it is not, and folks are curious, I feel like this is an audience that might be especially interested in seeing that documentary is really good. Um, I can try, we can try to get that information to you. Um, I know uh, I have, I'm gonna continue to um, have some questions I wanted to ask folks, but I also know um, one of my amazing researcher colleagues, um, Dr. Chun from the emergency room, pediatric emergency room um, had some really great questions that uh, I felt like they're, they're well-timed. Um, and one of the things that we talked about in advance of this meeting was how fortunate we are in the, you know, we're spending a lot of time talking about the integrated care clinic and all these great services that we have for our kids. And, you know, our kids need a part of what helps them function. Um, it is for their parents. And I will say that that is a much more complicated path um, that uh, I think either um, either Dr. Trin or Sullivan, both of you, I think would be better equipped uh, as adult providers <laughs> to answer that one. Who wants to take it? I, I am newly back in Rhode Island. I moved here two months ago. I don't no, but I, I just to bounce it back to you. Wasn't um Dr. Toll, Betsy Toll, was there not at one point a pretty integrated, similar refugee kind of one-stop shop health for adults? And I'm curious what has happened with that. Now being stationed as an OB at an FQHC, I... I can see ways in which that care would be coordinated. I just had someone the other day, a young woman and her mom, I, I'd taken care of an obstetric complication. It was very difficult. I had a follow-up visit with them. And I said, is there anything else you need? And she said, can you help us get better housing? And she said, we, we are asylum seekers. Like we're in the process. And I was like, I, like, I had nothing to do with this, per nothing to do with her daughter's obstetric care. And I was like, Okay, yeah, let me look into it. And so then I asked, so then, you know, as an FQHC, PCHC is wonderfully comprehensive and always growing, and I think would be really receptive to, you know, further, but, but so we do have a social worker here who's got, gonna look into it. So that's just one example of how I could see it growing and I could see how we could connect with further things. I'm so glad this family does have PCHC as a pretty integrated place. I don't know that it's specific to asylum seekers or refugees, but um, all that to say, I think if you have a, a well-resourced primary care clinic that's willing to be that anchor from which things grow, I can see how we could mirror some of what Hasbro is doing, but this is all theoretical. I'm curious if Dr. Toll is, if what, 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 if I'm remembering correctly or incorrectly. She retired, sorry to say. Uh, okay. Got it. Oh, she was really wonderful. But um, the other thing I will say is I am on the other side of, I, I'm on a side of this whole process that's new to me. I recently sponsored a family as humanitarian parolees from Haiti. Um, I'm not sure if everyone here is aware, but the, the pathways to lawful immigration under duress ebb and flow as administrations change. And like the number of refugees that were accepted were lowered and capped under Trump. And ultimately that cap, as far as I understand it, was upheld by Biden, despite the yearnings of many people. However, under Biden, there have been other pathways that open up not to refugee status, but to temporary protected status. Ultimately, it's called like humanitarian parolees. It started with a program called Uniting for Ukraine, in which basically individuals who could prove that they had enough financial resources could sponsor individuals from Ukraine 
200,000 individuals in the U.S. stepped up. It was considered really successful. And so that this opportunity has been expanded since January of this year to individuals fleeing situations in select countries, including Haiti, Nicaragua, Venezuela, Cuba, and others. And so under that program, in, I applied to sponsor a friend that I met while I was doing an away rotation in Haiti as a medical student. Eight months later, they are here, which is super amazing. Um, and I fortunately had the foresight to rope in someone a lot more organized than me. And, and through this welcome circle we have formed, I, I'm really impressed with the group's systematic approach to what it takes to get somebody set up for success as essentially a refugee. And this is the kind of wraparound case management that like I think refugee resettlement agencies typically do, but under this program, like we kind of just have to do it. And so um, it's included things like figuring out what benefits they're eligible for, helping them apply for federal work authorization, getting them social security numbers, getting them hooked up with an FQHC, which will take them until their Medicaid kicks in, you know, helping them get jobs, helping them find English language classes and that sort of thing. And so I'm learning what kind of feels like a comprehensive-ish checklist. And from there, if, if anyone is interested in like, you know, using that as a template to build a kind of way to coordinate services, I'd be happy to collaborate. But um, I don't know of existing resources in Rhode Island. And I don't know if anybody has replaced the work that Dr. Toll was doing. But that's what I will say that I agree. It is hard. And I don't think always as coordinated as maybe it once was, given that as I understand it, I think people fleeing from situations and coming to the US are doing so in a much more decentralized way than they once were. A lot of times it is random individuals like me sponsoring people and I, I, my, my feeling is that it's kind of less streamlined and it's less through two resettlement agencies like Dorcas and the diocese. I feel like it's kind of widespread and um, I think there's kind of a need for that kind of coordination across agencies. But that's my perception. I'm curious what you guys think. No, I love what you just say, and I I was actually uh, going to, to repose it to um, to Dr. Sullivan the same question. So go ahead. Um, so I I can confirm <laughs> Dr. Trin, that it is a uh, it is disorganized in terms of the ways that people are able to to come here, and it is certainly not streamlined. And often when when we arrive, we're just like where do we go and what what do we do for all of the things that you had mentioned like getting you know authorization to work and the social security number and like all of those things and really what each family needs is probably a case manager like right off the bat here you go here's the process and that's of course not not what happens um some of the things that come to mind for me for when you know i i was young and my family was going through this we had some providers that i think were genuinely really helpful and were not case managers um, they had asked us some questions that I think were helpful for my family. So one of the things that came to mind for them was, and I, I remember being in the room when they were asking this, but um, about what community supports, you know, we had had at the time and whether, you know, religion was something that was important to us. For my family, it was. So getting us connected to religious leaders in the area whom we did not know um, in, you know, ahead of that appointment was really, really helpful and made a huge impact for my family. And so that's just, you know, sort of one, one aspect of things. But I think even if we don't have like a case manager, or, like a bunch of resources right at the, at the get-go, even asking those questions, I think is important and can make a big difference. And sometimes I think I'll speak for myself as a, as a physician, I'm reluctant to ask questions that I, don't know the um, the solution for. Like I'm asking this, but then what do I do with the information? Because I don't have something to give you that's gonna quote unquote solve it. And I think it's important to still ask because I think that helps families realize that you are acknowledging this as something really important and you're going to work with them to try to figure out what we can do about it. So that particular provider asking about religion and community supports was really important. I think asking about, you know, the barriers that are present. I mean, I think it's our job to identify the barriers and to understand them, uh, even if we can't do something about the barriers right at that exact moment. So whether they're economic barriers, you know, geographic, cultural beliefs, there's stigma, there's so many other things that come into it. Um, 
And I think if you're if you're not used to asking these questions, it can be really hard, actually, and can feel kind of awkward. Um, but I think there are some really good resources to to start, you know, these sorts of um, conversations with families. So I love that you said that because I um, I agree. It is really hard to like when we walk into an interaction and we're we're thinking, here are the answer. Here are the questions I'm going to ask. Here are the answers I need to document in my notes. <laughs> um, and again, when people, you know, Dr. Lewis alluded to this earlier, when people are really busy and there's so much to do and there's competing demands and somebody, you know, is waiting in the next room, um, it can be hard to take that time. Uh, but I love what you said. I mean, we just need to sometimes ask those questions that we don't have an immediate answer for. And, um, I feel like I want to say that a hundred times over because um, it is so important. And I also love that piece that I think, um, I know we've talked a couple of times now about Bright, but I'm going to bring it up again because I think that's one of the reasons why Dr. Lewis and I got so excited about and engaged with Bright was that those connections that you can make to someone from the outside, it might be a religious organization, it might be, uh, you know, Brown University students, it might be some other initiative underway but those those things that help people rebuild a sense of community and connection in their their new home those are incredibly important um and i'm gonna stop talking because dr lewis i saw that you unmuted i bet you have lots to say about that no i you you said it all Um, and I saw in the chat that um, someone, um, I have a feeling there's a lot of people who uh, who are attending today that I would love to talk in, in the future with at some point, but someone was, it seemed like really knowledgeable about the latest in um, the med peds clinic. Um, so it has been taken over. And I did know actually that some, I didn't know some pieces of this. So Matt Lorenz is, um, has taken that over. Um, I know Dr. Lewis and I have worked uh, quite a bit with um, Megan Geary, which also um, brings us back to another question that had come up in the chat from Dr. Chun that about, you know, how do you coordinate care and services between providers, which um, is one of those things that I was actually hoping we would get to today to talk about a little bit. Um, I know also just to come back to what um, Dr. Trin said so beautifully, Things have changed um, during the pandemic as we, uh, as Rhode Island uh, received a number of Afghan families at once. It used to be that families got resettled in this, like you, like you said, through these refugee resettlement agencies in this very systematic way. And I shouldn't say it used to be, thanks to Dr. Lewis, <laughs> it became that way. Um, and, oh, and thanks to the fact that we had the tiniest state, so we could actually take statewide um, initiatives like this. Um, but now a lot of that has changed. A lot of our families are being seen out in, you know, are being resettled into um, places that are much further than uh, Providence or Pawtucket um, and are being seen by, there are a number of really great providers out there um, who are now starting to take on working with refugee families, um, adults and kids. Um, in ways that wasn't as common 10 years ago. Yeah, I, I would just like to mention two things. One is um, community, you're talking about care coordination, community health workers. Uh, it, it has been something they've done globally for decades and decades and decades. They, they, it's, it's, there's much evidence that it's cost effective, better outcomes. And in this country, there's been Minnesota and they, they have a really great community health worker net network. And I'm very proud to say, or relieved to say that Rhode Island Medicaid, um, about a year and a half ago, there's now funding, a department of eight, uh, DOH has licensing for it, and um, that there are community health workers now. And I'm our program now employs three community health workers, and one of them is uh, a former refugee um, who um, does the three clinics at MedPeds and CPC and, and at Hasbro and does a lot of that 
medical navigation, care coordination, educator. I know um, when we talk about community health workers, everybody has a different idea of what the what that role is, but um, has, uh, and, and so that's huge. So I'm thinking, I can feel the tides of over the last few years have started to shift. We're even talking about community health workers now for our general uh, primary care population who absolutely uh, need it. So I think that's, um, and and I think that the community, the province community health centers have uh, CHWs as well, don't they, Vivi? I, I'm I'm pretty yes, sure. Yes, I uh, believe so. I think they help with certain care coordination of like certain chronic diagnoses. Yeah, like yeah. So um, anyway, but I don't know. I'm new. Um, addition, and we we've I had a family. Um, who is not a refugee family, but a family I've worked with for a long time. And it wasn't until um, one of the community health workers uh, said, why are you giving your written inf information? She's very not comfortable with her reading. And, you know, there's th just things that folks can say to people where who they're interacting with others who have had lived experience that really makes uh, a huge difference. I will say that part of the reason why it's so confusing, you guys are both, everyone's right. It is more confusing how it's happening now. The refugee numbers are actually didn't go down under uh, Biden. They went way, they went back to the pre, pr prior administration. But there's something that they've developed called Welcome Corps. And it, it's, uh, it's very much mirrors more what they're doing in Canada and how they accept refugees. Um, it's very difficult to navigate because I've worked with a couple of organizations who have been trying to sponsor and it's a little trickier. And there are in, in a deep, indeed those other populations like the, uh, the Ukrainian and, and um, some of the other, um, that the um, Haitian uh, families who are coming under uh, protected status, which is different. Um, and I didn't is, know the numbers went back up. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for not letting me spread fake news. I'm sorry. That's so wonderful. But, but the big piece of it is is going to be through and not. And part of that is because so many of the resettlement agencies, when the numbers went down so low from usually it's been 90, 000, traditionally 90 to 110,000 refugees would be accepted annually since Reagan, since 1980. And then during the administration in 2016, it dwindled until it was about 15,000 in, in, in 2020. And even those 15,000 were primarily Eastern European. Um, and they okayed the higher ceiling number again. Um, but there's a lot of other folks who are coming in under different stats and it's overwhelmingly confusing and it does feel chaotic. I, I totally uh, agree with um, everything that you've said, but. So um, I uh, I have a bunch of things that I still wanted to ask. And also um, in these last sort of five minutes that we have, if people in the audience feel free to, as we're chatting, um, you know, ask any last questions that you have. Um, one thing that uh, I wanted to come back to that uh, had come up earlier is this this idea of how do we talk about things. I'm going to use mental health as the example because I'm a mental health provider. Um, but how do we talk about things that might not we might typically not have a common language for? And um, one of the things that I think has been really rewarding in working with refugee families about mental health really early on. Um, I was working with an interpreter and I asked, oh, do you ever find yourself feeling depressed and down? Kind of a classic psychologist question or psychiatrist question. Um, and uh, the interpreter said, oh no, we don't feel depressed in our culture. And I said, okay, well. Um, and so then I realized that I needed to start my questions very differently and I reshaped a lot of questions that I ask. So um, that's one where now I will talk about, um, you know, everybody feels kind of sad sometimes. Um, what are the ways that you cope? Like, what do you do when you feel sad? How do you make yourself feel better? And immediately people are like, okay, yeah, everybody does feel sad. <laughs> now I have a chance to, to really connect with them, hear what they experience. What is the way that they talk about this? Um, already they probably have a bunch of skills. I don't want to come in and decide like, here are the things you should do. You should be using these, you know, different manualized programs because maybe they're already doing a bunch of things and I can use their language 
to to make sure that they know those things can work in the United States too, or we can adjust them in some small ways. Um, and the other thing is that you sort of normalize it off the bat. So, yep, we're all going to feel sad. And now it's much easier for people to say, yeah, you know, I do feel sad. I feel it every day or however often. Um, and then similarly with the parents, you know, you need to think about um, if, if you, and this is, again, I think comes back to how beautiful a medical home model is. It's not as though Dr. Lewis has to say, I think your child has a mental health diagnosis. You need to go see a psychologist or a psychiatrist. She can say, oh, I have this partner that I work with. It'd be great for you to meet with her. You're telling me that the child's not going to bed on time or that they're refusing to go to school or that they're whatever thing that we want, that they want to make better. And then when they meet with me, it's not scary. They know how to find me. Um, and I can frame it all in the words that they care about, because as it turns out, no matter what country you're from, you don't live by the DSM. You don't live by this diagnostic manual and codes coding system. And so it doesn't matter what country you're from. I can talk with you now about how do you help make things better in your life? What is the thing that you wish was different and that you want to make better? Um, and so I do, um, you know, now that I said that, uh, I am curious what my what the panelists would say to that. What is the thing that you think we all can do to make better for, for our refugee families? And to your point, also asylum seekers. And I mean, I, you know, I think it's important that you've introduced those other language, uh, this, that language as well. And then I'm going to stop talking. Go ahead, Dr. Sullivan. Um, I just, I, I really love that you said that as it turns out, folks don't follow the DSM. I just, that was, <laughs> I just really, really echoed that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think how you were, you know, talking about just changing your language when asking families about, you know, I, I'll just talk about psychiatric symptoms, but um, asking about that, I mean, I think just mental health in general is a really challenging topic. And, you know, you certainly don't have to be a refugee or an asylum seeker to have a difficult time bringing that up in a provider's office. Um, so many families, you know, it's just not really talked about or discussed. I have found uh, with a lot of families, including my own, um, somatic symptoms are much more acceptable and okay. And so sometimes instead of asking about depression or mood or feeling sad or any of those or feelings in general, I will ask about okay symptoms to talk about like physical symptoms. You have a stomach ache a lot of the time. Oh, wow. Every day. Oh, a headache every day. Oh, man. And sometimes that will lead to questions of like, wow, do you feel stressed? Uh, because being stressed is something that everybody you know, really, really identifies with and is like, oh yeah, of course I'm stressed. Here are all the reasons I'm stressed. And then that often leads to, you know, leads to other other ways to to talk about things and you know more information for you and the family and i think just ultimately as you develop more rapport with a the family they're just more likely to to talk to you and get to know you and you know things come up but you know i think just uh mental health is is something that's you know really taboo in a lot of cultures um and that's something we just need to be cognizant of when we're interacting with these families thinking of things like suicide and things like that. I mean, there are so many religions where that is really considered a huge sin. And so even if there was a history of suicide in the family, that's not really going to be brought up. That's not really going to be talked about. And so, you know, understanding that that's just going to take time and take, you know, some, some just rapport building and, um, and just families to eventually, you know, get to trust you. And I think as, as providers being patient, uh, which I personally think is hard for a lot of doctors to be, um, but I think that's important. I love that. All right, Dr. Trin, you wanna add to that? The question is what is like one thing I would wish to see different, right? Yeah. Ultimately, okay. Yeah. Or like, I guess broadly, like what is the thing, what is the last sort of message you'd like to end our conversation today on, you know, related to like, what can we do? How can we not right. just feel hopeless? You know, how do we, what do we do next? Um, uh, um, <laughs> that's a different question that I was prepared to answer. I would say, um, well, now, now I'm much more interested in the question that you were <laughs> going to answer. And I, I, that would be the other thing that we've been talking about today, right? The like, you know, sometimes it's not about what yeah. we as providers walk into a room with, it's about listening and, and waiting. So tell me, what is it? Yeah. What, what were you hoping 
What, what did you, what were I, you? I think I can tie the two together, which is I think that loneliness and isolation are really big. And so if I was going to leave one message, it would be trying to, first of all, communicate your own care and to try to connect um, if you're encountering a refugee in a time seeker somehow to community, however that might be as you see fit, whether it is a religious organization like Dr. Sullivan's family experienced or it's summer camp or something like that. Um, my tutti, Apolline, her mom is so excited because an African market is finally opening up on the south or west side of Providence. And she's so excited, which is just, for me, that's about like connection to her home. And she's now in like a, a women's group, which is really wonderful. So, so really community, community, figuring out how to connect them to it. I'm actually just about to type a bunch of organizations that I think kind of going back to that care coordination could be a place where if something is beyond your in-house social work, at, you can maybe call one of these places and see what what you can do for a patient who comes your way. But um, I guess that would be the main thing I would want to leave people with. I love that. All right, Dr. Lewis. Hey, fi final thought. Um, I guess since many of the folks here are interested in medicine, I would say um, not only is this better for families, but it's better for providers when you're able to develop um, relationships and having interactions with families. Um, you know, we hear a lot about physician burnout these days, and uh, I, I may experience burnout, but it never has to do with my patients. And I think it's what feeds a lot of us. You know, people talk about triggers. Uh, but there's also glimmers in life and, you know, having these exchanges and um, opportunities to develop uh, these relationships in the context of providing the medical care, um, it will, it, it feeds the provider's soul as well. So in fact, I often think we get more out of it than the families do, but. I love that. That is those are all beautiful thoughts to kind of end on. I have learned so much from you all. I already knew you and and some, you know, Dr. Lewis, for, we've had so many conversations um, and yet I still feel like I learned so much today. So I'm so grateful for all of the panelists today. I'm grateful for all the folks who um, who have attended and um, feel free at any time to reach out to us. Um, I'm sure you know, any of us would love to, to connect with you um, or answer any questions you might have that you didn't have a chance to pose today. So I just want to thank all of you so much for your time and sharing your expertise. I can't tell you how fortunate I feel to have all of you doing this work in our community. Um, I'm really in awe. So thank you all. <laughs>